Uh, good evening, good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, for anyone who hasn't uh, been before, but I see lots of familiar faces. So uh, I'm sure many of you have attended the Cross Party Group in the past. Tonight is the AGM of the Cross Party Group. So um, I'd like to um, move on uh, quite quickly uh, to our uh, AGM business before introducing our speakers, which uh, our, our focus tonight is on uh, culture uh, after the UK leaves the European Union and the whole Brexit process and the impact that that will have on culture. And given that we are you know, that we're now very, very close uh, to the date when the UK will leave the European Union. I think that's really, really timely, actually. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, and I'll introduce our speakers later. Uh, but first of all, we, we have to get the business of the annual general meeting out of the road. Um, the cross-party group has to have membership from MSPs of three different political parties uh, and I'm pleased to say that we've managed to achieve four um, as well as myself Joan McAlpine uh, the members that I have confirmed this year are Gail Ross of the SNP Tom Ather of the SNP Claire Baker who is here with us tonight from the Labour Party uh, Lewis MacDonald from the Labour Party uh, Rachel Hamilton from the Conservative Party, who's also our Deputy Convener, and John Finney from the Greens. So we've got really a lot of support right across the par Parliament from this, for this cross-party group, which is very, very encouraging. Uh, now, the first thing that I have to do in terms of the AGM business, is that, is that the Secretariat? Yeah. Currently, since the cross-party group was formed, I think in 2012, yeah, 2012. Uh, Creative Scotland have been the secretariat. <clears throat> Creative Scotland have uh, have indicated that they do not wish to continue uh, as secretariat. However, Culture Counts uh, have <coughs> set, ag agreed that they were willing to step up to the plate uh, and uh, take over as a secretariat. And we're joined by Jennifer Hunter from Culture Counts. Jennifer, you just want to make yourself known. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So Jennifer uh, is, and, and Culture Counts are happy uh, to, to do that. Um, and our members of the cross-party ag group agreed that the Culture Counts could take over as a secretariat. Agreed. Right, OK. Um, do we have minutes from the last AGM? We do. Um, yeah. Um, are members happy to approve the minutes of the last meeting? Right. OK. We then have to um, put um, in place the um, politicians who, uh, it's got to be politicians that are convener and deputy convener, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's the rules. Um, so do we have any nominations uh, for convener? Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you. <laughs> Is the, are we agreed that I will remain as convener? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, nominations for deputy convener. Uh, I'm happy to nominate Rachel Hamilton. Has everyone agreed? That's great. Okay. I would like to um, take this opportunity to thank uh, Kirsten McLeod and Karen Dick from Creative Scotland who have performed uh, the role of secretariat uh, since the group was formed. They've done it really, really well. Uh, and I think it's fair to say, and maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I mean, it is one of the most effective cross-party groups with our website and with the, <coughs> the reach that it has and with the, um, the efforts that's put into making sure that we get a, a speakers from a, a wide variety of uh, Scottish cultural life. And that's down to the hard work of uh, Kirsten and uh, Karen. So um, I would like to show my appreciation for them if you would too. Thanks very much. Okay, so I think we swap over. And... Okay. Okay, um, so now we'll go into the, the business of the meeting at hand, which is on uh, Brexit and uh, the cultural sector. Uh, I, think, I think that, if my memory serves me correctly, that this was discussed a couple of years ago in the cross-party group. But I suppose at that time, uh, although people might have raised concerns and so on, it did seem very far away. 
Uh, but now, of course, it's, it's literally, you know, just round the corner. So I think tonight's, um, tonight's discussion is very timely. Uh, we're joined by Kirsty Hughes, the director of the Scottish Centre on European Relations. Uh, we've got Geoffrey Brown, director of Euclid. And I asked Geoffrey <coughs> before we started what Euclid stands for. He said it didn't actually stand for anything, um, but it, uh, it performs a very important function in that the organisation advises the cultural sector on European uh, funding and support. Uh, we also have Nick Barley, uh, the director of the Edinburgh International <coughs> Book Festival, and we have Caroline Sewell, who's the regional officer for Scotland and Northern Ireland of the Musicians' Union, uh, so she'll get give the perspective uh, more directly uh, of artists. Um, I think I shall uh, start with Kirsty, um, if you want to kick off, Kirsty. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, I rather thought, as the non-culture speaker on, on the panel, that I, I would go last, um, but, <coughs> but I'm, I'm going first. So um, I thought I'd make just one, one comment about culture at the start, um, <coughs> which, which is this. I think, I think Brexit has, has been hugely consuming. Um, it's a sort of Groundhog Day political turmoil and, and it's dragged the UK into you know very, very inward looking place just at a time, you know, when the world is is in quite a worrying looking place. And of course what's going on in the UK I think is part of that. Um and I think it's very hard for people to to figure out where on earth things are going, whether globally or with Brexit, um, and for people like me who, who've done a lot of political and economic analysis down the years, I would say our, our politics is not following any normal patterns, and politics may not always be a rational business. It involves power as well as debate. Um, I think where it is at the moment is, is, is very hard to fathom, and I think we certainly need, both for the UK and for the wider world, I think our artists and our cultural s sector and our creative people are, are vital, always vital, but I think they're especially vital at the moment. Um, I've been asked just to, to say a few words on, on where Brexit may be going. Um, after what some people call the political theatre of Salzburg, um, I don't know where Brexit's going, is, is the most honest answer, and I was I was quite intrigued to see some of my, my equivalents in, in the field, uh, if you like, after Salzburg, very sure of where it's going. Some people were sure that that was just political theater and, and there had to be this crisis moment and we'll head for a deal and everything will be fine. Other people, uh, including on the right, look at the Sunday Times, talked about it being a Suez moment. Other people talk about, um, we're definitely heading for a, Canada deal because Chequers is dead, all these phrases none of us had heard of a few, a few years ago. Um, I think it's not clear where <coughs> it's going. I think it's very important uh, to look at where the EU27 are at, which of course I think has been one of the failings of too many UK politicians in, in the last two years to just get consumed with the internal UK debate and especially the internal debate in, in the cabinet in London and in the Tory party. Um, <coughs> one important thing that happened this afternoon was that Merkel lost a key ally, ally in the Bundestag uh, and there was a vote for, for who was going to run the CDU CSU group and, and her ally lost and a more right wing figure came in. Um, I think so when, it, when we try and look at where it might be going, I think you have to very much factor in not just Italian populism or Hungarian populism, but where Macron stands, where Merkel stands, and, and, and so forth. Um, I think there's a, there's a very common view at the moment that it, if we get to a deal, and we may not, and it's quite extraordinary to think we may not, when, when we look, you only have to look at the government predictions of what no deal May, may mean genuine chaos, something close to catastrophe, but there seems to be a view at the moment that we're heading for a, a blind Brexit, or in other words, a fudged Brexit. So somehow, and we don't know how, but somehow 
we get, or the UK and EU gets to an Irish backstop, which has been, as you know, a huge um, block in the road because it's very difficult to achieve um, given Theresa May's red lines. Um, and then the political declaration on the future relationship about where on earth Brexit is going is fudged. It's something vague. And the reason why people imagine that may be the case is because it's not clear how else Theresa May gets all Tory MPs to vote for it because you've got the sort of Remain rebels, the Brexiter rebels, um, and, and so on. And, and we, hear, we hear from the Labour Party conference that Labour will almost definitely, but not definitely, vote against any deal May brings home because any deal she brings home is likely to, to cross the six, the six tests. Um, we hear the same from the SNP, um, assuming May is not about to bring home a customs union and single market Brexit. Um, are we going to have a deal by the middle of November, emergency extra summit? Is it going to be a blind Brexit? I have heard even in the last couple of days some other views on that, including from other EU member states. And it, it was very interesting <coughs> also out of yesterday's cabinet meeting in London that where people have predicted there might be a big push for May to back a Canada deal, there wasn't. And instead, she apparently emphasized her wish to have frictionless borders. But you can't have frictionless borders unless you do go for either a super soft Brexit or, or you stay in the EU. So that doesn't sound at the moment like a prime minister heading for, towards a, a hard Canada dry Brexit with a special deal for Northern Ireland, a border in the Irish Sea, and possibly Scotland or certainly the Scottish government at that point saying we want that special deal as well. But what I, what I did pick up in the last day or two was that on the one hand, countries like Germany and France, as Macron also made clear at, at Salzburg, are actually rather keen it's not too fudged. And one of the reasons for that is, much as they want a deal, they want an Irish backstop, they want the EU citizens, they don't want the chaos of no deal, they've got really important European Parliament elections coming up next May. They are contending with populists in various member states across Europe, and they're worried that a fudge deal might actually give comfort to the populists, that it might look not too bad to leave Europe. And if they give May the fudge <coughs> she needs on frictionless borders, however, however sort of, uh, you know, however vague it is, so, so that the EU doesn't actually have to deliver that after the UK leaves, they're worried about that. And I also then heard, actually from an Irish source, that the UK is still asking for a more detailed framework. I don't know if this is true, but the argument being, and it's a perfectly plausible one if we were in a rational political moment, um, that the UK has more bargaining power now than when it leaves. So it wants to get some things nailed down in that future trade deal. But the problem with that is, of course, it may make it much harder for, for Theresa May to get it through Westminster. So, so just to conclude, I mean, if there's a deal, and I think it still has to be more likely that there will be a deal than there won't be a deal, um, maybe very roughly at the sort of 60 to 70 percent probability level, but that's, that's not great if that's a 30 percent probability of no deal, then of course the question is, will it get through the Commons? Um, will the Brexiters vote against it? Will the Tory Remain rebels? vote against it. We saw it a crucial vote, if you remember, in early July on the customs union amendment that Theresa May won the day. So the customs union amendment by about three votes didn't go through. So it's, it seems to me it's still entirely possible that there's a deal and it's voted through. And if that happens, then Brexit is happening. And then we're certainly not going to stop talking about Brexit for, unfortunately, for several, several years to come. Um, if that happens, there's no reason to have a people's vote. There's no reason to have a general election. If that doesn't happen, and either there's no deal or Westminster rejects the deal, then I think we're heading for a very deep political crisis. And whether, again, looking at, at the, the complexities, shall I call it, around the Labour Party conference, we, we heard that John McDonnell got up too early to be told that the Remain was still on the table. Um, I don't know at what point Emily Thornbury uh, was at a fringe where she said uh, the Labour manifesto should, should say that we respect the result of the referendum. 
Um, but are we going to head for a general election or a people's vote? Or what happens if in Westminster there's not enough votes for no confidence in May? There may not be enough votes for a people's vote. You know, we, we could be in an escalating crisis. It's quite hard to imagine an escalating crisis over a few weeks or even a couple of months where you don't then potentially get to a general election. But I, I think it's all, it's all rather hard at the moment to predict. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop now because I've okay. run over my Thank five you. minutes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much, Kirsty. Geoffrey, what does all this mean for cultural organisations? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, luckily, I can swing the pendulum from the philosophy to the practical. Uh, I only have five minutes, so I'm going to focus very specifically on the, I think, the reason I've been invited, which was specifically to look at the impact of Brexit on the way in which European funds have supported arts and cultural projects in the last 10 years. Um, and I speak as we were commissioned a few years ago by the three major cultural funding agencies in Scotland to undertake research into this area. So for Creative Scotland, for Museums and Galleries Scotland, and for Historic Environment Scotland, we foolishly undertook to identify all projects in the arts, culture, and heritage sector that had received European funding in the last 10 years. What a complete nightmare that turned out to be. Um, at the end of it, although the reports that we wrote are peppered with a million caveats, mainly to do with the fact that the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in England uh, refuses to hand over information on publicly funded projects, which is quite extraordinary. But anyway, moving away from all that, uh, it, it, it appears that there is something like approaching £60 million worth of European, and I've converted into pounds, of uh, European funding that has gone to arts, culture and heritage in the last 10 years. Um, 35 million of that has gone from the European Structural and Investment Funds, and 25 million has gone from the various transnational funds. Um, the, the, those two, that distinction between those two is quite important because whatever Brexit we are talking about, unless we don't leave at all, the European Structural and Investment Funds are gone. Those are the funds such as the European Regional Development Fund, the European Social Fund, uh, the European Agricultural Fund and the European Fisheries Fund. Um, and surprisingly, those funds have provided the lion's share of funding to arts and cultural projects, particularly, um, but not exclusively, particularly in rural areas across Scotland. So, for example, to Highlands and Islands and Shetland and so on and so forth. Um, so, so they will go. Um, as far as I'm aware, and I know nothing about the detail of what is being decided within the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government and so on, so I could be proved completely wrong, uh, but my general understanding is that um, no allocations are being made to cover projects in sectors where there is not a significant lobbying action. Now, there is significant lobbying coming from farming and fishing and so on, so, so some of that's going to be covered, but to areas such as arts, culture and heritage, um, they are going to struggle, I think, to replace those funds from wherever it might be. Um, I could talk more about this, but I only have five minutes. So let's just go to the 25 million that's come from the uh, transnational funds. Now, the transnational funds, as the name suggests, are the funds which encourage cooperation um, and generally involve partnerships, either through exchange of, of, of individuals or organizations or through cooperation on projects. And that covers everything from um, the interregional programs, which technically are structural funds, but actually are about partnerships. It covers Horizon 2020, the research and, and science funds. It covers Erasmus+, Plus, which is education, training, and young people. It covers what is now Creative Europe, which is the media program and the culture sub programs and it covers the Europe for Citizens program. Um, interestingly, out of all those, the largest uh, batch of funding has come from the media program because the Scottish film sector is one of the most dynamic um, in the country uh, and has managed to grab a, you know, a significant amount of money for investment in those areas. So a significant amount of funds have come from that. Um, in, in the culture program, I just you know, plucked out a few examples just to illustrate the, the breadth of activity uh, you know, imaginate the, 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 the theatre company based here in Edinburgh have had funding for two projects uh, recently. Um, the Shetland Amenity Trust had a project funding for a project called Follow the Vikings, 
not quite sure what the implications of that are. The historic environment, Scotland, had funding for a project based on advanced Lyme applications in order to sort of, you know, worry about the preservation and restoration of projects here. Um, Creative Carbon Scotland has just received funding for a project. Uh, the Scottish Ensemble has received, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I don't, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds. In fact, there are 650 projects overall that have received funding in the last 10 years. So the amounts are significant. Now, what happens post-Brexit? Let's, let's uh, you know, as I said, the, the structural funds are probably gone forever. The transnational funds are a big question mark. And this comes back to uh, what Kirsty has just said. We have no idea. You know, the transnational funds, as they currently stand, are obviously open to the member states of the European Union, but they're also open in virtually every case to a range of linked or associated partners. So depending on the status that the United Kingdom might have once we leave, if we went down a Norway-type model, then there would be virtually no change in our eligibility to participate in these transnational funding programs. If we start moving away from a Norway model to a Canada-type model, let alone to a World Trade Organization off the edge like Lemming's um, arrangement, then we may be less eligible. We would become a third country in terms of our eligibility. Now, that's still possible, but it will limit the way in which we can participate. Um, that's all I want to say, apart from the fact that it is obviously a great regret that my five minutes have meant that I've focused on simply on the mechanics and the specifics of the funding. Because let's not forget, and I'm sure other speakers will say this as well, that what European funding has produced, particularly in the transnational projects, is opportunities for cooperation and collaboration, which enables the arts and culture to thrive, which enables individual artists to find opportunities which are going to be beneficial to them, beneficial to their projects, and beneficial to communities. So I think that, you know, while I've concentrated on all that, I'd love another half an hour to go on about the, the absolute important philosophical underpinning of what European funding has provided in the last 10 years and what should continue to provide, particularly if the UK finds itself in a position where we are no longer as integral or integrated as we have been for the last 30 or 40 years. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Geoffrey. And I'm sure you'll have the opportunity to say more uh, during the discussion part uh, of the evening. Uh, um, what I forgot to say at the beginning of the evening is that we have a, a lip reader with us uh, in the room tonight. So uh, for our speakers in particular, but also for people um, on the floor, make sure you don't cover your mouth with your hand, which is a bad habit of mine. <laughs> um, so um, if you could speak clearly, make sure your lips are always on show. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick. Thanks very much for inviting me, Joan. And I have to say, following on from the previous two speakers, I feel very ignorant. I have absolutely no idea what impact Brexit will have on culture in Scotland. But I do run a festival in Edinburgh, and I do know for sure, that on the basis of what's going on at my festival, that the Brexit situation that we're currently in, let alone what's about to happen, is having a tangible effect on public democratic discourse in Scotland right now. People don't know what's happening and don't know what's going on. And if, if one simply compares the level of public engagement that we saw during the independence referendum in 2014 with the quality of the discourse uh, in 2018 around Brexit, it's a, it's a very, very different situation. Whatever side of the independence debate people were on, they felt engaged in Scotland and they were willing to speak up. And I think the reason I'm invited here is to talk about the tangible effects of the Brexit situation on culture in Scotland, and I will try to do that in my five minutes. To do that, I have to explain that the Book Festival, if you haven't been to it, is not just a literary festival, it's a festival of ideas. At its best, it's a kind of grassroots democracy. Uh, it's an example of civil society in action, and the kinds of speakers who come to the Book Festival are not just novelists, but also politicians, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, Joe Swinson from the Lib Dems were here this year, as well as Yanis Varoufakis, the former Portuguese culture minister. It's a, it's a political forum for discussion, and that's important uh, because it helps us to understand what's going on. Um, uh, if it's going to be a, a democratic forum, it has to be properly inclusive, and it has to be properly international. Uh, we endeavour to be inclusive. Uh, for example, we've done projects in Cumbernauld, Glenrothes, East Kilbride, Irvine and Livingston this year, among others, with refugee groups, with homelessness groups and so on, in an attempt to try to bring people into the discussion from across all walks of life. 
to be international, it goes to the very heart of what we and Edinburgh's other festivals are. And um, I think that's the thing for which the Edinburgh Book Festival is best known. It is international. And, and that's not just authors and visitors. It's also publishers, festival directors, who come from all across the world to see what's going on at what they regard as the best festival of its kind anywhere in the world. We are, if nothing else, international. Um, and, and evidence for that is that this year, this autumn, the next month, I'm invited to go to, I've just come back from Christchurch, New Zealand. I'm going to Buenos Aires, Toronto, Rio, Nairobi, and St. Petersburg at the invitation of other festivals who want to find out how Edinburgh does it. That's how international we are. So what are the challenges that Brexit will bring to that? I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I do know on the evidence of this year's festival that the situation generally is causing us problems, and specifically, problems around getting visas for international authors, artists, and musicians to come to speak here. So over the past couple of years, we have faced increasing problems securing visas for writers, but this year we saw a step change in, in the problems. This year, 12 authors had visas refused. Uh, they were all authors either from the Middle East or Africa this year. In the future, I, I imagine that that number could go up and up after Brexit, if, if the wrong kind of Brexit <coughs> happens. Um, I didn't want to name authors because they were you know, feeling humiliated, but a couple of them named themselves. Uh, so Nehru's Karmut from, from uh, Gaza named herself, and Esan Abdullahi, an Iranian illustrator, also. But there were many others who, behind the scenes, were telling me how humiliated they were by the situation. I have to say we got fantastic support from the British Council, from embassies around the world, from Deirdre Brock, our MP, and from the Scottish Government, who really, really wanted to try to make sure that Edinburgh can continue to get visas for its authors. But what we're talking about here is people who are household names in their own country, who were being humiliated, they're telling me they were humiliated by the process of asking for a visa. Imagine if we asked Irvin Welsh, to give biometric data, to give a birth certificate for one of his children, to give a marriage certificate um, in order to prove that he was who he said he was, to give three years' worth of bank statements, uh, which were then uh, questioned when, if there was a, any kind of sum of money in the bank account which didn't uh, look, look ordinary. Utterly humiliating. And, and authors were telling me that, that that humiliation was something which would, would mean that they would not want to come back to Edinburgh in, in future years. And I, I, I thought enough was enough, and I went to the press. And what surprised me was that the story went around the world. It clearly touched a nerve around the world, and it got picked up across all the media, TV, radio, uh, press. And I got contacted by many festivals across the UK, and I realized this is not just about Edinburgh, not even just about Scotland. This is about the UK's festivals who are facing a crisis here, and we've got to resolve it. Um, the publicity resulted in a visit from David Liddington, who's the, the de facto Deputy Prime Minister, to find out what the heck was going on and why I was causing a fuss in, in the media. And he left <coughs> promising that he would look at the situation. He told me that there was a, a House of Lords uh, working group who was working at trying to secure better visas. Um, I told him I wasn't just speaking about the book festival. I was speaking about organisations uh, across the UK. I didn't want just to speak for organisations who have secured this permit-free status, which a few, uh, the International Festival, for example, has secured permit-free status. This is not just about the, the, the big organisations. This is about festivals across the country. There are many, many of them that need to be able to get authors and musicians and artists here to participate. So what can we do about it? Well, uh, Deirdre Brock uh, wants to ask a, a parliamentary question. So she, she is very fixed on, on trying to get uh, to help the situation. I think we need policy change, and I think we can secure policy change to make, ensure that we get short-stay visas for artists, musicians, authors, and so on, to come to festivals. Festivals are a special case where people may only come for one or two days, and currently the visa situation is set up to be difficult for even for people who want to come for a six-month residency or, or a six-month uh, working visit. But for somebody who'll come for three days, it ain't worth it. And we need to, to have a special situation. What about any festival which has is, which is qualified for Creative Scotland funding, Arts Council of England funding, Arts Council of Wales funding, they've all already jumped through hoops, that they are given a kind of card they can play 
which says, yeah, trust us, we want to bring this person. They're not going to abscond. They're famous in their own country. They've got no means of, of earning a living in their own country. Don't worry. Trust us. And if en ever that trust is abused, I'm happy for you to take away my card. A simple situation in which the festival is given the responsibility for ensuring that their guest will play by the rules. I, I can't see a problem with that. And I suggested that to David Liddington, and he seemed to agree. I think in Scotland, this kind of... Uh, it is part of our, I hate to use the word brand, but Scotland as a progressive democratic country where civil society really works, this is the kind of thing where we can lead the way by fighting for legislation to change. Without it, we're facing, and I conclude, we're facing humiliation for artists, we're facing embarrassment for Scotland and for Britain as a whole, and I think potentially we're facing a catastrophic situation for Scotland's festivals. We've got to do something about it. Thank you very much, Nick. And I should say that actually Nick's going to the press and the, the, the fuss that he caused is probably the catalyst for having this, this meeting tonight. So uh, thanks very much for being here with us and for that presentation. Um, and I'd like to move to Caroline. Um, uh, are there reflections of what others have said in, in the experience of, of working creatives in, in your industry? Um, thanks very much, Joan. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I would echo a lot of what um, Nick has, has actually just said. Um, some of you might be aware that way back before the referendum, seems like a long time ago, um, the MU governing body, our executive committee, agreed that the MU would take an anti-Brexit stance. Now, it's fairly unusual for the MU to take a stance on such a potentially divisive issue. However, this decision absolutely highlights just how crucial we view EU membership to the employment and the income of our members, many of whom work in Europe, either on a freelance basis with orchestras, um, touring as individuals, touring uh, with groups, um, or working for theatres or orchestras on touring productions. Now, since the referendum, we've worked closely with MSPs, MPs, the, Lord, the, wider, the Lords, the wider trade union movement and the music industry to try and secure and protect musicians' careers um, in Brexit negotiations and in a post-Brexit environment. And we identified five key issues, being the protection of working musicians' rights to travel, copyright protection, workers' rights more generally, um, the rights of EU citizens in the UK and arts funding. Now, the very nature of working successfully in the music industry, as many of you will no doubt know, is to be rehearsed and to be ready to say yes and to confirm work um, immediately or certainly as soon as possible. So as not to pass up any opportunity to generate income or to further develop your audience and importantly, to broaden the possibility of generating further work in the future. It's quite simple. As a musician, if you're unable to do that, then the work will simply go elsewhere. And that isn't a risk that many um, musicians I know can afford to take. Many of our members rely on working abroad and on international touring as a crucial source of income. And international touring visas and carnies already present barriers to musicians working abroad both financially and in terms of logistics, um, the very length of time it can take to organize the correct documentation. Um, Anybody who has worked or um, toured in the States will be painfully aware of this. It can cost thousands to take a band to the States. Um, and the cost of fa fast track visa processing fees have just gone up by 15% as well. Musicians and other creative and cultural workers are a distinct workforce with specific needs. So visa customs rules post Brexit really need to account for this. Musicians often visit multiple countries on tours, often jumping across borders on a daily basis with very little notice. And if every musician has to get a visa and a carnet for every country they visit, it will make working in Europe not only impossible to schedule, but impossible for most musicians to budget for. And this would apply across the board, whether they are an emerging band or a world-class orchestra. Further to this, let's not forget the importance of cultural exchange. As creatives, musicians rely on the exchange of cultural ideas, and we are at risk of damaging our reputation as a country who are culturally open. We also risk losing a valuable source of exchanging best industry practice. The picture for musicians who work in Europe is often a rosier one than uh, that of the musicians who work in the UK. And if I just take France for an example, musicians benefit from pensions, welfare, and social security, which actually also includes um, unemployment checks for periods in between work. Um, 
Jeffrey's already touched on um, funding for the arts, and again, I would absolutely agree with the sentiments that I can't see um, this funding being um, replaced from either local authority or central government. Now, as well as the touring and the funding issues, for musicians, um, the issue of Brexit also throws up problems in the recording and broadcasting sphere, not least because we are subject to the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, along with the rest of the EU. Now, leaving the EU won't force the UK to change its copyright laws, but the UK government could decide to. Also, there are reasonable numbers of European producers, so by that I mean labels, uh, film companies, library companies and such like, coming over to the UK to use our orchestras and freelance musicians to record on an annual basis. And after Brexit, there's likely to be a greater problem in those parties coming here, um, as Nick's just alluded to, due to visas and taxes and really a landscape that we're quite unsure of at the moment. Um, but we're getting a, we're getting a flavour of it. Um, and we definitely anticipate that this will have an impact on the level of employment of UK recording musicians. The MU are campaigning for a reciprocal free movement of musicians and performers across the EU in the form of an EU touring visa, which must be affordable, multi-entry and admin light. The MU Executive Committee has actually also recently voted to back the People's Vote campaign for a second referendum because we believe that our members and other workers should have their say on a final Brexit deal and what it might look like for them. Most musicians are already surviving on low incomes. Over half of our members earn less than £20,000 a year, and many of them survive on much less than that as well. Musicians' income's already been stifled from a range of different angles, and a post-Brexit landscape without assurances of being able to uh, work in the EU is potentially catastrophic for many of our members, whose ability to earn a living will be seriously affected. Now, I was hoping to end on a positive note, <laughs> um, but there's not too many positives to take, I don't think. Other than what I would say is that we know that the music industry has always and is constantly adapting and responding to threats and challenges, and I'm sure that Brexit will be no exception. In the meantime, we can simply hope to reach some kind of agreement whatever that may look like, which is not stifling to musicians and the wider cultural industries and that we're not left culturally worse off as a result. Thank you very much. Um, uh, hmm. if, if we're talking about European funding, I think it is fair to say that the cultural sector has found it difficult to speak with one voice because um, it is quite diverse, ranging from the, you know, the, the, the highly commercial aspects to the very subsidised. Um, and it has been difficult to sort of find a single umbrella under which it can coalesce. Um, the, the strongest lobbying at the moment is coming from the Creative Industries Federation, uh, which is mounting uh, quite a successful campaign. And in spite of the fact that they are the Creative Industries Fed Federation, they are quite clearly um, opening themselves up to, to try and represent the whole breadth of the cultural sector. The, the, because they have the words creative industries in their title, they are actually more able to gain access to members of parliament at Westminster, for example, because members of parliament at Westminster will hear the words creative industries and go, aha, that's an industry. That's something which we can talk about rather than whatever they might write off as arty farty activities and so on. So there has been success as far as that's concerned. Um, in terms of the individual funding programs, I can only speak, you know, for ex clearly the, the, 
you know, we're talking of difference of scale here. If we look at Horizon 2020, the current budget for that is 80 billion euros, which is you know way, way beyond any other funding program. And so therefore, that is a crucial um, um, uh, opportunity and resource for universities and science and research. And so therefore, they are a very strong lobbying force. But, but, the, but the, there is a sort of slight trickle down effect from that. As a result of that, that has also led the education sector to therefore lobby on behalf of the Erasmus program. And because of that, you know, the, 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 there at least are guarantees, providing we don't leave with a complete no deal, there at least are guarantees that funding for projects which, um, for which the deadlines are before the, you know, we leave will continue until after. Uh, but, but we have been very much at the sort of end of the trickle-down effect as far as that's concerned. And if we go back to the structural funds, we're funding for agriculture and infrastructure projects and so on and so forth, the cultural sector, with one or two exceptions in particular regional areas, the cultural sector hasn't coalesced in order to be an effective lobbying, unfortunately. Um, I'd venture to suggest that uh, most of the discourse around Brexit, I mean, even the word deal or no deal, is, uh, is discourse which is economic. It's about the economic impact of Brexit. And we've, we've been hoodwinked, I would say, into thinking that Brexit is really about what, how rich we are. And therefore, I think the cultural sector is, has, has lost out in that discussion. Um, uh, they've been forgotten. Um, and if you talk to people in the cultural sector, most people don't have, have any idea how culture will be affected after Brexit. I think it's time for us to, to reclaim the discourse. When Europe came together uh, uh, as a European Union after the Second World War, it wasn't about trade so much as about peace, about trying to avoid war. It was, it was for human beings to try to, to understand one another, which of course is what culture is all about. And I think it's time that we, that we reclaim that, that sensibility around what Brexit will mean culturally for this country. I'd like to ask, thank you everybody for your um, presentations, they're really interesting. Um, Kirsty, could I ask you what you um, make of the announcement today with regards to the Prime Minister and her cabinet announcing that uh, there wouldn't be a, a singular approach to immigration and that it would, be, it would look at non-EU and EU migrants as one and consider skills um, as the focus of that approach. And apparently there's going to be an announcement at the party conference. And I wondered if you had any insight onto that. Um, I mean, I, I think today's announcement is very important and I think it bears directly on the discussion we're having. Um, I, I think, as, as, as you say, it, it, it had two, two main elements, I think. I mean, I haven't read the document, just, just the reports, but one was to say there, there would be no preference given to EU over non-EU workers, which, which is a huge thing, but there was then a, a sort of a caveat which said uh, the more sort of close trade deals the UK post-Brexit negotiates, there may then be uh, a better a better migration and visa regime, but that wouldn't just be for the EU, that might be for a, a trade deal with the US or or India, so so it sounds quite stark, and I and I think I think that's quite problematic, both in terms of whatever future deal we do negotiate with the EU, um, because if we're not going to offer something very close to free movement, that will impact on the type of deal the EU will offer us. And I think, as as we've just just heard from from other people on the panel. Um, the fact that there has been that, that free, free movement and visa free and, and so on in, in Europe has been, has been very important. So, I mean, I don't know what Nick thinks in terms of, of the wider international, but I think as you know, he's rather dramatically made clear, um, the sort of the hostile in, environment sort of impacts both on Brexit and, and more widely. And, and I also think, I mean, I, I would just very much want to agree on this point that it's become very economic. And, and not just that the EU was a peace project and a solidarity project, but, but that it's affected the UK's political standing, its, its security, its stability, and that must impact on the way we're viewed culturally and artistically as well. So, so I, I don't see it as positive today's... Oh, sorry, my hand, sorry. 
I don't, I don't see from what I've read so far, I don't see it as a positive announcement. In addition to that, because the UK government's announcements so far around immigration are very um, high-skilled based, certain sectors based, well, what we're hearing from the panel is we need flexibility, we need short-term visas, we need quick visas. That doesn't seem to be anywhere in the discussions so far. Is there any other countries that do operate the kind of model that you would like to see? We might just be in a unique position because it looks like we're heading for an isolated position and other countries might already have relations. They they're not countries that aren't part of the EU, but they might have other closer relationships with other countries where there's a freer movement for creatives. Is there models that we can look to think that's how it would, that's how it would work? Or? Um, I'm not actually aware of any. Um, other members of the panel might ha might be aware of any, but I think I think we're in. I think that's the problem here is that we're trading on uncharted territory, um, and that this hasn't been done before. And at the moment, the cultural sector and certainly um, the music industry, um, you know, from our end of things, you know, we're absolutely kind of feeling our way through the dark. It feels like on a lot of things, which makes it difficult to lobby effectively. And I think that's all part of that's all part of the a connected problem. Um, is that there, there don't seem to be any models that I can think of or that I'm aware of um, that, that we could replicate, certainly, that would that would work effectively for um, certainly our members and I think a lot of the, the wider cultural workforce. Yeah. Yeah. A brief, brief follow-up comment. I mean, I think one of the... I mean, there's so many extraordinary things about the Brexit debate, but, but one has been, especially in the sort of couple of months after the, the so-called checkers plan, um, is the fixation on goods, not services. And cultural sector is a, a rather special type. You probably wouldn't want to be labelled a service, but, but you know, it's not producing manufactured goods. And, and, so, and services are a terribly important, competitive, profitable, positive side of the UK economy, whether it's culture, whether it's computers, lawyers even maybe um, and it has been extraordinary how, how that focus on frictionless borders has, has been about frictionless borders for goods not services and there hasn't been more of an outcry on that I think. Hi, I'm Julia from Festivals Edinburgh um, and I was in Brussels yesterday actually talking about these very issues um, and it was equally inconclusive, I'm afraid, I have to say. But um, we did talk about the, the DCMS's um, ambition to negotiate the cultural accord for the UK with the EU 27. Um, and I suppose if there is a uh, you know, potentially positive outcome, I hope that it's through that and maybe through building on visitor visas um, rather than going through the, the kind of skills and points-based system um, and I think that's in line with the kind of flexibilities that the Musicians' Union is, is, is looking for. Um, and I, uh, the other point that resonated for me about yesterday's discussion was, I think brought up by Kirsty at the very beginning of our presentations, which was, um, could we, and this is my point to the panel, I suppose my question to the panel is, what could we seek to achieve by making common cause with the EU27 um, and not simply trying to argue the case on the, on the British side, because obviously what we want is for the Europe, e, remaining EU side to come to the table saying that they want these things, as well as um, us persuading the UK government that we want these things. That's an interesting point, and I hadn't been aware of that position in terms of a cultural accord, so I don't know if members of the panel were aware of that and what their views were on that. I've, yes, I've been working in the, the European Union um, sector, or what is such as such as it is, for over twenty years, and and and, and, and sadly, one does become a little um, sceptical over over time, and I think one of the worries at the moment about uh, the culture accord. Um, or any of these sorts of initiatives that, that are emerging from different sectors about ways in which we can build these sorts of bridges, is that it, it, what is another lack of clarity 
is the degree to which the solidarity being shown by the EU27 is going to override the wishes of individual sectors within the EU27 to build new arrangements. And I think that's another area of quicksand and uncharted territory at this stage. You know, at the moment, what we're having is that, that the EU, surprisingly or not, depending on your point of view, is falling back on a solidarity in terms of their negotiating stance with the United Kingdom. And we are, although we are technically leaving on the 29th of March, we are then going to be in a transition period. Is that solidarity going to main, be maintained for the period until the end of 2020? Is 20, the end of 2020 the end date, or is that going to be extended? It's another whole set of questions. And during that period, to what degree are independent um, cooperations and accords and agreements going to be allowed to go forward if they are being negotiated with the imprimatur of ministries and official government agencies? You know, and I, I just think that's an, another whole question. And I'm sorry to throw a bit of cold water around, because I think that what I hope will come out of that is that, that organisations like the DCMS will at least provide some additional support and succour to the sector as a whole, so that while they're trying to negotiate an accord, they will be supporting other opportunities for ongoing dialogue to happen between the UK sectors and others in Europe to explore all the different issues that we've talked about. Because, you know, there, there are, it is this extraordinary vast breadth, whether we're talking about visas or funding or VAT, which is another whole nightmare, all these sorts of things. They're all things where we need to have dialogue with the other 27 over the next little while. But I'm, I'm, I will watch with interest about how the accord progresses. Okay. Before moving on to the next speaker um, from the panel, I'd like to welcome Tom Arthur, MSP, to the meeting. Thanks very much for coming along, Tom. Uh, Nick, did you want to come in on that? Uh, I just wanted to uh, think of it from a different, uh, a different angle, really, which, which is that um, even if you, we do accept that, that the Brexit negotiations will primarily be defined by issues around, cult, uh, around the economy and trading, uh, it makes me think about that uh, when China opened up to, to the, the possibility of trading and, and we were all told, you know, when you hand over your business card, you have to hand it over with the card in both hands, uh, otherwise you'll offend your, your, your interlocutor. And to me, that, that was a sign of a kind of, of the fact that, that we need to understand each other's cultures, even if that is in order to do business with one another. There's no trading without understanding and cultural dialogue is part of that, of, of understanding. If you want that to lead to trade, then fine. So maybe we should get wise in the cultural community and, and understand the, the impact we make on doing business. I, I think we have fallen into a trap over recent years of defining ourselves by the, the contribution we make to, to economies. You know, culture is worth X billion pounds to the British economy. All that uh, has been necessary for us to do, to do but it's, given, it's put us into a kind of trap. Culture is important for something much more fundamental, which is about, about international uh, dialogue and understanding, which will eventually lead to, to trade. So maybe cultural accords in Europe are, are part of that, but I think it's something also about the, the way in which we describe what we do and, and its importance that will have to change. Yeah, I, th I would absolutely um, echo what's been said, but also, you know, again, as, as, as Geoffrey mentioned, we are, it feels like we're very far away from gaining any level of clarity of what that might look like, even though the, the MU are, are actively lobbying and, and there is a petition, by the way, that's, that's online, and if you do agree with us, then please go and sign it. Um, but... Um, yeah, it's really difficult to know what that might look like. Obviously, for, for us and for our members, it absolutely makes perfect sense, particularly around the area of copyright harmonisation and, and, and really what it might look like if, if we start to dismantle um, copyright law and um, the, the, the types of decisions that would then have to be made, everything from term of copyright to EU jurisdiction over copyright infringement cases it's, it's you know um so there, there will have to be a degree i would imagine of, of um cultural accord um what that will look like and and how achievable it is across the board um is remains to be seen what you seem to be saying uh, to me was that uh, you know the eu 27 as you yourself had said are 
are kind of hardening in their position as, the, as, they're, as they're aware of these European elections coming up and, and they may take a particular road politically, but is it possible for cultural organisations to cut through whatever deal there is and kind of bypass the politicians to create accords? Is that a realistic uh, scenario to, to kind of conjure up? I mean, I, I, I think it's very difficult at the moment, and it's partly, partly one big element of Brexit, as we've heard, is uncertainty extraordinary sort of range and depth of types of uncertainty and so you know you can try and be a bit more positive and constructive you can try and say you know if brexit goes ahead and even if like me you, you think that's going to be in enormously damaging and destabilizing you can say if brexit goes ahead and there's a deal so at least there's been a divorce deal and then there's work on the future relationship. So it's not a complete crashing out. We're not building on Theresa May visibly angry, giving press statements after, after Salzburg. Then, then yes, there will be a real wish to say, goodness, you know, UK, one of the big European states, we've got to rebuild relationships, culture, a much more straightforward way to do that in, in lots of ways than, than if actually you're trying to grab some of the financial services sector or something like that. But I think one of the things I've learned and a lot of people have learned as, as we go through this Brexit process, if that's the right word for it, is just the extraordinary depth and range of, where, of how our societies work, how they're regulated, what, you know, I'm sure you already knew about copyright, but did we all know about drugs, the European Medical Agency, this, the extraordinary range of regulation and laws and things that, that make up our lives. So you can have a cultural accord, perhaps, that, that says all sorts of nice things and starts to heal some of the wounds, but actually the depth of it, the detail of it, is I think what we've heard tonight, you know, is what you actually need. And it, and it sounds to me just like I hear actually from in other sectors, you, you sort of scratch a bit and then you find find it's really complicated to, to make sure that drugs that are already on the market will still be recognized and accepted on the market afterwards. And, and so the devil, I think, is in the detail and combine that with uncertainty and, and the, the positive side of we'll always want to interact culturally, hopefully, is, is very hard, I think. Um. Hi, I'm Martin. And, uh, uh, from, from what the panel said and from what I hear in the news, I haven't yet heard one positive about um, why Brexit is a good idea. Um, I feel like we are disappearing down a rabbit hole. Um, it's going to get very dark um, and we're going to go inwards and into ourselves as far as I can see. I haven't heard anybody who has who is selling a positive. The panel can't give us a positive about um, culture in Scotland and internationalism. And I just don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Um. Yeah, I think you've probably summed up the mood of uh, the panel pretty succinctly there. Um, that's exactly it, and that's exactly why the Musicians' Union have, have, have taken the stance that they have on the People's Vote campaign. Um, I read somewhere, that, sorry, forgive me, I can't remember who it was that said it in the, in the press this week, that you, you can't kill democracy with more democracy. Um, you know, ultimately, people were asked a binary question when nobody had any idea of what the fallout was going to look like. Um, so how could anybody um, give a, a, a response that they could truly say that, that, they, that they meant? Um, and so it seems entirely reasonable to let people have a say on what this final deal is going to look like. I think way back then, it'll be, it'll be fine. They'll, they've got a couple of years to work it out and it'll be fine. Actually now, you know, it feels like we're weeks away from, from, um, you know, from, from getting to the rabbit hole and disappearing down it indefinitely. And I think what the Musicians' Union are asking is that actually instead of this kind of blind acceptance that this is where we're going, this is, we have an opportunity to ask, you know, a final question. 
um, because I hear exactly the same as you. I work in this industry and these industries and I haven't heard any positives or projected positives. Plenty of projected fears um, and, I'm, and I'm looking for them. I'm a pretty positive person usually and, and, I'm, and I'm looking for them but you're right, they don't seem to be uh, forthcoming. <laughs> Uh, yes, interesting point. Um, the, the cultural sector will survive and grow in certain ways because that's what the cultural sector does. People are resilient, they are creative, they are imaginative. They will find ways of developing their art and their activity and so on and so on and so on. The difficulty is that when you look at the reasons that appear to underpin why people voted for Brexit about taking back control of our laws and our finance and our borders and so on and so forth, it is very difficult to see how the result of all that is going to be specifically and directly beneficial to the cultural sector. The cultural sector thrives on opportunities to meet and mingle and be stimulated and be creative and to stimulate others and so on and so forth. And at the moment, the prospects for Brexit do not appear to be helping to develop or expand those sorts of opportunities. So on that basis, some of us are concluding that although we will do the best we can and we will provide ways in which we can point the cultural sector in potential new directions, at the end of the day, this is not going to be beneficial for the cultural sector as far as we can see at this particular point. And if people can point out to me how this is going to be beneficial for the cultural sector, I would be very interested to hear it. But at the moment, that doesn't seem to be happening or available or an option or anything else, sadly. Uh, I think we're all searching for tangible, concrete things that we can do. Uh, I, I might be wrong, but my impression is that the people who voted, and have 17 million of them voted to leave the European Union, voted primarily, above all else, because of concerns about what they perceived uh, to be immigration, uh, people taking jobs from people, you know, from British people. That was, that's my understanding of the primary reason for Brexit. I believe that in Scotland that there's a different story. Scotland needs immigrants, it needs a migrant workforce more than any of the other, certainly more than England. And I, I, I know it's a difficult job, but I think that the Scottish Government can do even more to underline the need in Scotland for an immigrant population in order to make this country economically viable as well as culturally viable. I think that's, that's a tangible thing that we can do. It, it doesn't, it, it's difficult because there's no legislative power around this, but I think there's a message to be given out about the importance of, of welcoming international uh, residents in Scotland. Can I just ask you, Nick, because the, the, the examples that you raised tonight in terms of the, the visas for, for authors uh, and that you raised previously in the media, they are not European citizens. So why do you think that that uh, is related to Brexit? I think that there's a, there's a wider climate. Um, it, it's been described as the hostile environment. Um, but I think that there's the, that I think Theresa May's... Uh, aims to try to, to reduce immigration and, and the numbers have been put on this, uh, the, the targets to reduce immigration have led to changes to visa and immigration procedures, both for uh, people who propose to, to live in the UK permanently, but also to visit on, sh on short stay visas. The, the, the climate within the visa and immigration office has changed. Much of the work has been outsourced with very clear instructions to, to refuse visas whenever possible. It's the kind of instruction which is, which, which is currently being operated outside the EU, but will, unless we, unless we make sure it doesn't happen, will happen within the EU as well. 
once uh, once we've once Brexit has happened. And you also mentioned something that I wasn't aware of, and uh, maybe people out there are aware of it in the audience, but I wasn't aware that some festivals did have visa-free status. Is that how you described it, visa-free status? Um, how many festivals and arts uh, events have visa-free status? Uh, other people might know the precise number. In fact, uh, I think it's eleven. Eleven. Um, right. So four, four or five Edinburgh festivals have it. Yeah. At the moment, um, we are working with Culture Council, in fact, to uh, look at the, the possibility of the criteria being expanded so that festivals that are not as big and don't have as many international performers coming through um, would also be able to apply for the, the permit-free status. Um, but I think one of the things not to, uh, not to get mixed up about is that permit, under permit-free status, you don't need a work permit, but you still need a visa. So if the visa conditions are onerous, that's still a problem. Yeah. Um, David Liddington, when he visited me at, during the festival, said, oh, we can, we'll sort you out. We can get you permit-free status. Um, and I said, well, actually, I don't think that's the point. Uh, I mean, WOMAD is another festival which has permit-free status, but which, which really struggled with visas this year. I think, I think even if there were a permit-free status, there's still an issue around visas as you say, which isn't overcome by, the, by this status. And in any case, at the moment, the permit-free status is only granted to large uh, organizations, large festivals. And I think there is, there's, we, have to, we have a responsibility as large festivals like mine to argue for the small festivals too, which are very international in their scope, but tiny in scale, and still need to be able to invite international Yeah, And I suppose outside artists. Edinburgh, most Scottish festivals would fall into that category. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we have the lady in the black hair and then the lady in the middle. Who, who wants to go first? <laughs> I, I wonder if I could ask the question because it really is very closely to what we've been talking about. My name is Moira Jeffrey. I'm from the Scottish Contemporary Art Network. Um, Nick, I'd like to thank you very publicly for the contribution you made to bringing the discussion about visas and about the hostile environment and the implications of Brexit into the public domain, we are currently working with our members to research the impact of these issues in the visual arts sector. I'm interested at the moment that your proposals are around festivals specifically, do you think there's scope for a wider coalition of interest in lobbying around these issues? Um, because that's something that our sector, which does include festivals, but includes lots of arts venues who work with artists from overseas for short periods of time, would also be very interested in. Absolutely. Um, I, I speak for festivals reluctantly because I don't feel like that I know, understand all festivals, but I, I felt pushed into that position. I would gladly speak for other cultural organisations if, if, if I feel that I can be useful um, and if other people tell me that, that they face similar kinds of problems. I think there are other kinds of organisations, let's say opera, where, where international visitors might, might spend a number of months in a country and might need a different kind of visitor from the kind of visa that, that I think I'm specifically uh, talking about. Uh, and I think festivals, it, it may be different for, for example, for an artist coming to install an, an art exhibition. I'm not sure, but I think it would be good to, to have a dialogue around this. But, we're, but really, it, I, I think artists who are coming to, to, for a short period of time and uh, for whom it's not worth the bother and the cost and the humiliation of going through the current processes. That's, I think, what, what uh, we, it's a quick win. We can easily change the situation. And if, and if uh, artists and, and galleries and exhibitions fall into that category, then let's talk. Um, I'm Jean Cameron, I'm an independent producer and curator. I'm also board member for National Theatre of Scotland. And I think we, um, let's shoot for the moon here. If you look at the new work that's created in Scotland, the commissioned work the, the, that happens in our theatre spaces, as well as um, gallery settings, um, I think we've got that opportunity to make the case for people coming for a period of time, culturally getting to know each other, making work together. That takes time. Let's recognise that um, rather than 
just the festival model. I think it's important, an opportunity. And just to, to echo something that uh, Julia said, as well as the skills-based approach to visas, Scotland makes culture differently from other parts of the UK. You know, we've got a global first through our year of young people just now. We've got an incredible face movement. We have a lot of non-professionals who are engaged in cultural experiences that the, re the rest of the world looks at with envy. So I think keeping that case for the visitors and the cultural exchange for those of those people who are part of the cultural fabric of this nation, who are not solely professionals, is important. Um, and I guess through the Commonwealth, my Commonwealth Games experience, I had to deal with both types of visas, and really both are quite vital to who we are. Thank you very much. Yes, sure. Hi, I'm sorry, John Cairns. You've all pointed out that the cultural sector is quite weak in well-being. Um, how do you think we could strengthen that? Who would be best placed to take a lead on that? I mean, Geoffrey mentioned the Creative Industries Federation, and they are primarily based in London or in Scotland. And I think a specific issue for us is going to be structural funds, especially in rural areas, very dependent on those for cultural and wider social benefit. So, who do you think? I mean, I'm not suggesting take money away from farming and fishing or anything like that, but how? How can we make sure that some sort of support continues for cultural and social sectors, particularly in rural areas? I think Rachel wanted to address the supplementary staff. I was exactly the same thing, actually, and I was interested to hear what Julia had say, said about being in Brussels. Um, it seems that not many people, including me, knew about the cultural white paper. Um, would, would that be fair to say? Um, I think it's important that uh, people are given the opportunity to feed into uh, the consultation of some of these um, white papers, including um, some of the, the funding that uh, DCMS are looking at, which is Creative Europe. Uh, I believe that's a 74 million um, pot. So I think it's a very, very important point to make sure that Scotland's cultural voice is heard um, when considering, particularly when equity have, um, you know, made representation um, as, as a union towards that p white paper. Just, just one point, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, it's not something I'm f fully across, and someone else in the room may well be, but uh, as I understand it, the UK government is, is talking about replacing structural funds and, and there's a, a, a new body or a new fund whose name I'm afraid I've forgotten, but what, what I understood about that was that there was going to be uh, first big strategic discussions of that this autumn. And, and it comes back in, so on the, on the one hand, therefore, yes, there may be replacement money and certainly something therefore to lobby for, but for me more it makes the point I made before about uncertainty we're trying to reconfigure so much of our structures and society at the same time that that's obviously extremely late and I've no idea what the time scale then is. I don't know, Geoffrey, maybe you know more about, about that. Well, I think one of the problems is that there's moving goalposts. Uh, in my understanding of what they have said about um, uh, structural funds is that, that there may be what they might at this stage call replacement funding, but what that is likely to turn out to be is going to be significantly different with very different sets of criteria and very different sets of, 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 of um, ways in which it is applied. I mean, for example, uh, at the moment they have said, in, we just look at the farming funding, what they are saying, and I'm talking about UK-wide at this stage in terms of what's being said in Westminster, I appreciate um, it, it's slightly different, well, it's considerably different, but what they're saying in Westminster is that the agricultural funding will only be guaranteed until 2020. 
and that what they are looking at after that could be replacement funding, but on a wholly different set of criteria, uh, which may or may not be relevant, valuable, whatever. They're talking about environmental criteria rather than necessarily the criteria that the um, common agricultural policy and so on has, has happened in. And, and I think that's what makes it so difficult, because what we have at the moment in terms of the discussion about what's happening in the future, even in terms of these funding programs, is like jelly. And, and, you know, and, and, and to try and, A, get a lobbying movement together that is, you know, you usually get a lobbying movement together where there is a clear focus for your lobbying. When you're lobbying about what might happen in the jelly, it is considerably more difficult. And I, 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 I mean, you know, if somebody said to me, you know, what are you going to, where are you going to focus your lobbying? I have to say that, that and it's a terribly pragmatic approach and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to anybody, but I would say that you may need to focus on the areas where you feel there is the highest chance of success. And I personally feel that, that money for culture in rural areas is not going to be successful in the short term. It may be successful in the longer term once we see how things are going to pan out and in terms of when we have a bit more knowledge about the structures that are going to come into place. But in the shorter term, I think that the focus for any lobbying, if, if it's going to try and gather together the incredible breadth of people across the cultural sector, has to be much more pragmatic and focused. In terms of funding streams, you've got the Creative Europe funding stream, but structural funds cover a whole gamut of of areas that are intended to uh, promote equality across all the regions of, of Europe and they could be they may include culture in rural areas but they may also there's a lot of employability disability funds housing all sorts of things that are covered by uh, structural funds but uh, what you're saying is that we should focus on the creative funds is that what you're saying I think what I would say, I mean, just one interesting point, you know, if, if you go back to the, the, the European rules and regulations about the structural funds, it is blindingly clear in the, in the documents that, that come out of the European Commission and so on, that, that it is completely within the remit of all the structural funds to put as much money into culture and arts projects as they would wish to do. But the problem is that the final decisions are in the hands of the member states and if it is a large member state, it is in the hands of the devolved regions, countries, nations, call it what you will. And by the time you filter the structural funds down through all of those sorts of areas, the commitment to those principles that have been established in Brussels about supporting arts and culture have virtually disappeared. And that's one of the problems I think we have here, because there are other people lobbying about the use of the structural funds for infrastructure, employment, farming, whatever it might be. So that's why I think what I'm saying is that I'm not necessarily saying about focusing on any particular funding programme, but I think that if you are going to focus on opportunities post-Brexit, then I think those opportunities should be about cooperation and collaboration. And those opportunities, because cooperation and collaboration, then bring in the issues that range from visas to intellectual property to VAT and also encompass the transnational funds which are relevant uh, you know, to anything to do with cooperation. So that seems to me to be a potential focus for a lobbying pinnacle movement, call it whatever you, whatever you will. Okay. Yes, the lady in yellow there. Um, I just had a question um, regarding the point that was made earlier. Is there are any um, examples of other European countries that might have um, shorter term visas and so on? I was wondering about Switzerland, if that could be a model. Um, I myself have worked there for a few years. Um, I'm a European citizen. I had to work under a work permit. I worked in a venue. We had international tours. I was a producer myself. I people coming, and companies coming and going. So everything there is a little bit faster. You still have to do carnet and visa and all of that. Um, obviously, I am not really involved in all of the political um, spectrums in the back, but that might be maybe a model that could be know, copied or at least taken as an example. I don't know if anybody knows about anything there. <laughs> Switzerland is such a unique case, and, and, and 
you know, because, because of Switzerland's geographical location, because of the languages, because of the, the decision to stay outside the European Union, but to wish to be connected with the European Union, because it doesn't have the sorts of complexes that the UK has about its historical role and so on and so on and so forth, Switzerland has been able to be more adaptable in the way in which it deals with other European countries, with exchanges, with, with a whole range of things. We are, in my, in my view, the UK is nowhere near that level of understanding or adaptability at this stage. It may be, but that is talking about a cultural shift, and I mean cultural shift in the different sense of the word culture, um, you know, amongst the peoples of the UK to, to adapt to being prepared to accept the sorts of ways in which Switzerland works, which does very successfully on that, on, in, in the examples that you've given. Just, just briefly, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on Switzerland's migration policy, but obviously Switzerland does have a free movement agree, agreement with the EU. And, and, and despite what Geoffrey just said, which may be true in, in some ways, um, in terms of the complex web of agreements the EU has with Switzerland, because it voted against the EU and then against big in the European economic area, and now it has uh, dozens and dozens of bilateral treaties that, that do almost the same. Um, the last thing the EU wants to do is replicate that, because it, it, it's proved very cumbersome, very problematic, very, very hard to, to update. Um, I mean, could I just make one other point while, while I'm speaking, which is, I mean, well, two things, really. Firstly, uh, Caroline especially has talked about the people's vote. I mean, and, and the, the gentleman who talked about it being very dark, but Brexit doesn't have to happen. I think the politics of the next six, nine months is very, very unpredictable. Um, but I also think it's maybe interesting to think about the differences between Scotland and England and the rest of the UK, and obviously England and Wales voted for Bre Brexit. England is deeply divided, um, whereas in Scotland, you've, you've got, as somebody was saying, you, you've obviously got the positive Scottish government discourse anyway about migration. You've now got 66% of people uh, backing Remain 61% backing a people's vote, and, and actually that's very party split, so those numbers are pulled downwards by conservative voters supporting leave and not supporting a vote, but across other parties, divided on independence, um, but Lib Dems, Labour, SNP, Greens, way over 70%, both for Remain and for a people's vote. And even if, if Brexit goes ahead on that basis, Scotland's got an image in the rest of the EU as being the country that voted Remain. So how Scotland will come to terms with Brexit is going to be different, I think, to how England is going to have to come to terms with whatever national identity splits and problems drove it. Um, so, so it's, I mean, it's not going to be completely separate, but I, I really think that's something to think about. And it, it, it doesn't help you get over these problems of funding, but it certainly gets over questions of how Scotland is seen and therefore how you interact around the world. Uh, I've got a practical suggestion, a proposal for another thing for what the Scottish Government can do, which is to help set a new understanding of for how long a referendum has currency. Because <laughs> one of the very difficult things to argue against is people who, who say, well, there's been a democratic vote f to leave the European Union and the will of the people must be carried out. Of course, the fact that in 1973 the people of the UK voted to go into the European Union uh, is, that, is that not still valid too? Uh, one of our problems with democracy is that referendums are, are, seem to be this thing which, and we don't really know for how long they last. In parliamentary democracy, we have a clear period of time after which people are allowed to change their minds. When are we allowed to change our mind about the referendum and legitimately hold another one? And of course, it's a very relevant question for the Scottish Government about another referendum. When is it allowed to have another referendum? We, if we could sort out, uh, if we're going to have these referendums, how long, they, how long they, they apply for, then we could sort out quite a lot of the confusion around Brexit. Uh, my name is Gordon Dixon I'm from the Scottish Artists Union. We uh, survey our members every year and we ask them two questions. Um, have they received 
uh, seen any impact on Brexit already and what their concerns are for the Brexit date next year. Um, some of our members are already seeing the cost of supplies coming from Europe to make their work, um, increasing by as much as 10%, and they're really concerned about the additional cost of trying to sell the work to other areas in Europe. Um, they've mentioned a lot of the things that have been raised this evening, two that they brought up, which was breaking my heart when I was reading them through on the train over from Glasgow. One is um, uh, a lot of our members are EU citizens or married to or partners of EU citizens, and they are very concerned what their long-term status is living in this country and I think that's something to remember as well when we're thinking about the freedom of movement as an artist but also your right to reside in any one particular place as an artist. And the other one as well as highlighting the concerns that people are having about funding in the Highlands and Islands but also um, a lot of our members have worked really hard to establish relationships across the European Union with fellow artists and organisations and exhibitions and institutions and they're worried that the credibility of those connections is going to be undermined by Brexit and I think that I'd like to ask what do we do about that? How do we repair the damage of a vote that Scotland um, didn't um, agree with um, when we go forward and try and deal with what we've got coming up? Um, I'll come in <laughs> and um, not to back off a question at all. I think the last part of your question is again, it's it's, it's one of those. How 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 do you you know we don't know how we are going to perceive be perceived, and although Scotland does have you know um, a very different um, thinking in terms of of, of um, compared to England, certainly in terms of of Brexit and how we well the most of us um, have viewed Brexit. Um, it, it's one of these unknowns, and you know once it's once we're there, you know, there's no, there's no undoing any of this. Um, once we get there, it's not too late actually at the moment. You know, it's, it's not a done deal as yet. Um, but you know, come March next year, it, it will be. Um, you, you, you mentioned about um, EU citizens, and for our members as well, many of our members are EU citizens who reside in the UK. Um, our um, orchestras. Many of them rely on EU citizens, um, particularly actually the Ulster Orchestra in, in Northern Ireland because of the, the very particular geography. Um, it, it will leave a gaping hole um, if the worst happens and the EU citizens can no longer be here. But again, it's, it's something that we have not received any kind of assurance of. Um, so again, you know, and we're only talking, you know, a few months down the line, and we haven't received any assurances of what that cultural landscape um, might look like. Um, we could potentially um, have a bit of a crisis situation, and certainly some of the some of the orchestras um, who are going to have a lot of empty seats if we have to send all our EU citizens back to Europe. Um, so we just um, have to really try and work towards the best possible deal we can. But sometimes it feels like um, we are um, a very small voice in a very loud room. Um, and I think that's part of the problem, certainly, when it comes to strengthening our lobbying. I mean, actually, although we all come from our own respective parts of the cultural industries, very many of, of the issues which we're facing and we're talking about are the same issues. So, you know, absolutely, we can have a collaborative approach. Um, and I would like to just pick up again on, on um, what the, the gentleman mentioned earlier on about, um, you know, the rural communities as well. I am really concerned about our rural communities who definitely need um, support with their infrastructure. Um, and, you know, bearing in mind that Scotland is a very rural country, and there are rural elements to areas in other parts of the UK as well, but Scotland particularly, um, and many of our members certainly, are not full-time musicians, are, you know, do music, but have to prop up that music with other work. And actually a lot of the time operate as solo enterprises, that because of their solo enterprise status, they fly under the radar a lot of the time of, you know, cultural research and data gathering. And I just feel that this is actually a, a, a huge voice that we, are, we aren't, hearing and that we haven't heard enough until now and that it potentially is at risk of disappearing. Um, so I share your concerns. I'm not sure if we have any other points from the floor, but I'd be quite keen to perhaps move on in the sense that uh, we seem to be kind of coalescing around a number of 
themes uh, that have emerged tonight. Uh, one is obviously the issue of the immigration status, the whole issue around visas and permits uh, for artists, both in terms of working in Scotland at, at festivals, but also and in terms of cultural collaboration, but also our, our people being able to go and, and work in Europe. So that strikes me as something that is maybe something we would want to take forward as a group. The other thing is the confusion around what's going to happen in terms of the funding uh, for creative activities, both through Creative Europe um, or the lab, well, Creative Europe is going to stop, but whatever replaces the cultural, so we don't know what's going to replace the Creative Europe funds, and we have had some kind of hint that structural funds are going to be replaced by, I think it's a kind of UK equality fund, but it's just all a bit vague. I, this is just, I'm kind of like improvising here, but um, given uh, what Nick said about his relationship with David Liddington, um, <laughs> that's not to put too fine a point on it. If, if, if I could suggest that maybe some of the points that have been made and the concerns that have been raised here on those two strands, plus the issue of rural communities, because I think that's really important, because as, as this group has shown with many um, previous uh, meetings that we've had, the input of artists into rural communities is transformative, not just for creative activities, but also for economic activities as well. So th those kind of three things, I don't know if we were able to maybe approach David Luddington uh, about those three things and, you know, as the cross-party group and say that we, we, we were concerned and we would like some feedback in the UK government as to, as to what their plans were. Uh, does, is everybody happy with that? Have I covered everything? Is there anything that you'd like to add to that? I, I think the only thing that we, that we haven't talked about is it's also about this, um, this idea of tourists coming to the UK and coming to Scotland to come and experience our culture. Um, if it's difficult to get visas, it's going to be a hell of a lot more difficult to get visas um, when we're not in the European Union. So a lot of the visitors who come um, to go around the, um, the 500, you know, they'll come on the ferry from Europe and then they will drive on the motorbikes around or in the cars. People who are coming um, to experience the International Book Festival or any of the um, international festivals, they're going to be put off. And so our, our economy is going to be hurt. So, you know, so there's that flip side as well. Yes. That needs to be well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we could mention that too, um, certainly, yeah. Jennifer, would you be able to maybe put something together on behalf of the cross-party group and uh, just cross-party group that I'll, I'll, I'll sign off? Um, is that okay? Yeah? And I'll share it with members of the panel tonight, if you, if you wish, since you've had such an important input. Kirsty, did you want to...? Pressing the wrong button. <laughs> uh, I just wonder if it's worth adding something there about the short term impacts because, you know, maybe in two or three years it will have gone ahead, but hopefully if it goes ahead there won't at least have been a no deal. But, you know, uh, I think there was something on one of the news programs last night at one of the airports asking people if they booked their holidays for next year yet. And, and they hadn't because of the uncertainty of no deal and will the planes be flying. So whatever happens in three years' time, it's quite possible because of the uncertainty that you may be facing a dip in, in the coming one to two years, and, and, and those sorts of short-term dips can have sort of longer mm -hmm. effects. Um, what he can do about that, is not, short of stopping Brexit, is another question, but I, I think it could be worth just adding something on that too. Okay. I do, I do think the issue of funding and the issue of... Uh, cultural collaboration and, and, and Vsauce uh, seems to me to be the, the, the really key issues. And I, I, I guess the fact that David Liddington has approached you and also what Julia was saying about DCMS, everybody knows what my view is on it, I'm staunchly remain. But perhaps, you know, like if you have had these discussions that suggest that maybe there is an open door that we could lobby, um, you know, for these issues. Julia. That was my only other thought, is whether it was also worth writing to Jeremy Wright to say, um, I've been sort of Googling away here trying to see whether there are any formal channels to respond to that 
development of the cultural accord, and I can't see any formal ones, but um, if, if we could write a similar letter to Jeremy Knight asking for engagement with that department. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure whether David Lidington was speaking on or off the record or whether it was a, a public comment he, he's, he made, but, so I should be somewhat careful. Mm -hmm. But he did say something along the lines that, he, that he, as, as the cabinet minister, minister for the cabinet office, he has license to poke his stick into whatever department he feels like. And so he could t speak to Jeremy Wright and he could speak to Sajid Javid. And he thought that between those two departments, the answer to the particular visa problem might lie. So he was offering to be a kind of cabinet fixer between departments. Mm -hmm. So if some of these issues do fall between uh, government departments, then, then he is the man yeah. to yeah, talk without to. Without betraying a confidence, we could approach him and say, we know that you have expressed an interest in some of the concerns that were raised during the Edinburgh Festival. They were discussed tonight at the cross-party group, and this is what we, we request, that you, you can have, if you can use your influence to take this forward. Okay, um, well, we'll circulate it amongst yourselves. Um, and hopefully get it off soon. Now, I think we're kind of slightly ahead of time, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. We've had a really good discussion tonight. Um, we were going to discuss, we have another date in the diary for the next meeting, Jennifer, don't we? That's in December. The 12th? December the 12th. So if you put that in your diaries, uh, we haven't... We haven't discussed the, the topic of the meeting, so uh, all suggestions are welcome. Uh, but you'll get plenty of notice as to what the topic of that meeting is going to be. So um, I mean, you've, got, you've got 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes or so to chat before you're chucked out of the parliament. And I think there may well be more wine outside as well. So uh, uh, feel free to socialise. Thank you very much. And I'll now close the meeting. Thank you.